in December of 1978, Littleton was a, a relatively small, quiet community. It was a winter morning, uh, would have been a skiff of snow uh, on the ground, and people would have been getting up, uh, going about their normal duties, maybe uh, walking or driving uh, through the neighborhood. The quiet suburb serves as a bedroom community for the nearby city of Denver. Families who live here enjoy a comfortable retreat from city life. Uh, Littleton's a city of about 40,000 people within the city limits. Uh, the area sits south of Denver, uh, made up of really nice homes, not huge, but well manicured, lawns look good, a place you wouldn't mind living. In addition to a leisurely pace and low-key lifestyle, the citizens of Littleton enjoy a low crime rate. In 1978, Littleton had probably two murders in Arapahoe County, maybe three or four. Relatively low crime area, very quiet neighborhoods. One of the families living in the quiet neighborhood is a family of four. Robert Spangler and his wife, Nancy, their son, David, and their daughter, Susan. As Robert goes off to work every day at the American Water Works Company, Nancy is happy to stay home, raising the kids. Neighbors said that the Spangler family was just well-adjusted, typical family from Littleton. The kids were 15 and 17, the boy was into guitars, and the girl was into her boyfriend. And I think Nancy was a stay-at-home mom who was working on a degree. December 30th, the image of the picture-perfect family is about to shatter. It is mid-morning on the week between Christmas and New Year, and most families have taken the week off for vacation. Tim Trevithick, the 16-year-old boyfriend of daughter Susan Spangler, arrives with plans to spend the day with Susan. Tim had been to the house the night before and left the early morning hours. When he got up that morning, he called the house and then went over when there was no answer. His usual thing when he came to the house, if no one answered the door, would be to throw some pebbles at Susan's window. He got no answer to the pebbles. Tim uh, went to the laundry room window and uh, crawled through the window like he usually did. He went upstairs to Susan's bedroom, and as he entered the door, he, he hollered for her to wake up. When he didn't get a response, he threw his, his gloves at her saying, Sue, Sue, wake up. But Susan Spangler is not sleeping. The closer he got to her, he realized that she was possibly dead. Trevithick races to David's room for help. He turned around and ran across the hallway to her brother David's bedroom. And he found David half in and half out of the bed, and there was blood on the floor around him. Susan's boyfriend calls the police in a panic. Authorities from the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office arrive right away and secure the premises. What they discover is a crime scene so grisly, it defies all comprehension. Susan was shot and had a single gunshot wound to her chest, and it appeared to be uh, she was shot from a distance and probably died fairly quickly. David, he also had suffered a single gunshot wound to his chest. It is not over yet. A third deeply disturbing scene waits for the police in the basement. It is the body of Nancy Spangler, also dead from a gunshot wound. Mrs. Spangler was found in the basement of the residence. She was uh, found seated, slumped over to the right in front of a typewriter. The uh, gun was found a short distance away. There was a typewriter on the table, and there was a note in the typewriter. Investigators read the letter. It appears to be a suicide note. The suicide note was like an explanation of what had happened. 
Uh, Nancy explained how she had found the gun by accident and didn't know why she never told him she had found the gun. She mentioned that she decided to do this and they had argued about who would have the kids and she stated, I guess I will in the note. The typewritten note is signed with a single handwritten letter, the letter N. It appears to police to be a double murder suicide, but the investigators from the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office are careful not to rule out any possibilities. One of the biggest mistakes you can make on a crime scene is jumping to conclusions without having all of the data both that's available and it needs to be dug out. Crime scene investigators get to work photographing the three crime scenes, carefully collecting evidence and taking prints from the typewriter and the apparent murder weapon, a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson. In photographing a crime scene, your first pictures are an overall picture, then narrowing in closer and closer and closer showing all the detail of anything that might be in any way applicable to the situation you're investigating. She was slumped over, bullet wound to the head. Uh, the gun was a two inch revolver positioned some six to eight feet away from the victim, which is, while not unheard of, is rather unusual. Later in the afternoon, Robert Spangler arrives to discover his house is a full-blown crime scene, surrounded by police cars and yellow caution tape. A Bob arrived home while officers were processing the scene in the late afternoon hours. Uh, when he was told what had happened in his home, uh, he appeared shocked at what uh, he was being told. A distraught Spangler confirms that the alleged murder weapon, the 38 Smith & Wesson, belongs to him, but that he was not at home at the time of the killings. As Spangler tells the police his story, a different picture of the family starts to emerge. They met young. They were both from uh, Ames, Iowa. He was a football star. She was a beauty pageant contestant. And they were young sweethearts. They married young. Robert Spangler, according to people who knew him, said that he was a nice man. They thought he was charming, outgoing. You know, they said he was generally a good neighbor. They thought he was a good provider. It is a different picture from the apparent murder-suicide the police discover on December 30th. Nancy's parents uh, and most of her family just never even considered this possible. She wasn't the type. She would never hurt herself or her children. And uh, she was nervous around guns. So they, they didn't believe it. Police from the sheriff's office interview Robert Spangler. He admits he and Nancy have been having marital problems. They'd been separated for a while and actually had just recently reunited. He was having an affair with a woman he worked with in his office, Sharon Cooper, and it had caused some tension in the marriage. Spangler insists to police that although Nancy was distraught about his affair, he is as shocked as anyone about the apparent murder-suicide. Spangler cooperates fully with the police. He recounts his every step that day. Bob explained that he and Nancy got up that morning and they got into an argument. He left the house to cool off for about an hour, an hour and a half. Uh, said that he drove around uh, listening to the Bronco game on the radio and then later went to a movie that afternoon. To help with their investigation, Spangler agrees to take a polygraph test, but the results come back inconclusive. Our polygraph operator, he reported back after making an attempt at it, the Spangler was so uptight that any results coming from that polygraph machine would be meaningless. Finally, crime scene investigators check Spangler's body for any trace of evidentiary material. 
we're looking for signs that the person uh, had handled a gun or, or had fired a gun uh, or had touched the gun after it had been fired. It usually takes some time to get the results back, certainly not in the same day, perhaps not even in the same week. The gun residue swabs are sent to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation for full analysis. In the meantime, police conclude their interview with Robert Spangler, and he is free to go. But the Spangler residence is still a cordoned off crime scene. I was asked to have Spangler stay at my house because it was obvious he could not stay at the crime scene when we were at my house. I was surprised at how calm he appeared to be, uh, having lost family earlier in the same day. On January 3rd, the coroner rules the case a double murder-suicide. But soon, evidence will emerge that Robert Spangler knows more than he is letting on. Nancy Spangler and her children Susan and David have been found shot to death. The crime has been ruled a double murder-suicide. Husband Robert Spangler has submitted to a polygraph test with inconclusive results. Suspicion grows when the results of a gun residue test arrive from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. The results are surprising and troubling. Gunshot residue tests were completed on both Bob and Nancy. Nancy's test did not reveal the presence of any gunshot residue. However, one of Bob's hands tested positive for the residue. February 3rd, in a follow-up interview with police, Robert Spangler makes a change to his story. Later on, Bob had an explanation for the gunshot residue. Uh, he said that he actually did go into the house, went downstairs and found Nancy and the gun was close by. He explained that he had picked it up, stepped back, making the statement, oh my God, and then dropped the gun onto the floor, turned around and left the residence. During the investigation, police had noted two sets of tire tracks in the freshly fallen snow on the day of the killings. The tracks match the tires on Spangler's car. This supports his new story about arriving at the crime scene and leaving again. Despite the official ruling, Nancy Stallman's family is convinced of Nancy's innocence. Further, they suspect Robert Spangler knows more than he is letting on. After Nancy's death and the children's death, the family saw Bob Spangler at the uh, funeral services. They, he had hastily cremated the body. He was accompanied at the funeral by a girlfriend. He didn't behave like a typical grief-stricken mate and father, and they were suspicious. On top of their other suspicions, Nancy had written a letter shortly before she died. And in that letter, she was talking about the future. She was excited about things. She said that, you know, they were trying to reconcile. And it did not sound like someone who was despondent and thinking about suicide. The close-knit community of Littleton is devastated to learn of the family's deadly tragedy. Despite the suspicions of the community and some members of the police, the case is closed. Life in Littleton goes back to normal. But for some, there are still too many questions that need to be answered. Questions mostly to do with Robert Spangler. When I picked up the case and I found out that all the evidence, except for the suicide note, had been returned to Bob Spangler, that included the gun and everything else. Something I thought was terribly strange. As for Robert Spangler, 
the widower takes little time adjusting to his new life. After the murders, Bob Spangler moved back into the house, which his neighbors thought was very strange because uh, there had been three murders in the home and they didn't think somebody would really want to move back in. To the shock of local residents, Robert Spangler marries his former mistress, Sharon Cooper. Sharon moves into the house where, just months earlier, Spangler's family was brutally murdered. Spangler told police that he was good at putting the past behind him. He didn't dwell on the past. He could compartmentalize things and just move forward. Robert and Sharon share similar passions. The couple make frequent hiking trips to the surrounding area. Robert and Sharon shared a real love for the outdoors. They loved to hike, particularly in the Grand Canyon. And Sharon had written a guidebook about the Grand Canyon that was really well received, so she was kind of known around there. Sharon's book, On Foot in the Grand Canyon, is widely regarded as an authentic look at the pleasures and very real dangers of hiking the canyon's steep trails. The Grand Canyon is a place that draws backpackers and hikers to have an outdoor experience. It is an incredible location. However, it is not to be taken lightly. The trails are precipitous. It's not like there's guardrails or safety nets or that sort of thing. The Grand Canyon Rangers rescue hundreds of people a year. And there are deaths that occur in the Grand Canyon. With a new wife and three dogs, it looks like domestic bliss. Robert Spangler described Sharon as the love of his life. She was his second wife, and he described that they had a unique relationship. And she was a bubbly, outgoing person, according to those who knew her, um, quite different than, than Bob's wife. But after a few years, trouble emerges once again and the married life of Robert Spangler. Shortly after Robert Spangler's father died, Sharon Spangler began a real emotional downturn. You can draw all kinds of inferences from her behavior as to what she was beginning to understand about Robert. All in all, it does appear that Mr. Spangler was not having very good luck with wives, or his wives were not having very good luck with him. In about 1986, uh, the sheriff's office received a panicked phone call from Sharon Spangler. And when officers talked with her, she told them that her husband was out to get her. He was after her. And the authorities had to go out. They found her in a closet, um, panicked, and they had to take her to the hospital. Robert Spangler and Sharon Cooper get divorced. It is the second Spangler marriage to end in a shroud of mystery. Sharon Cooper moves out of the house and out of Littleton. The divorce takes a financial toll on Spangler as he is forced to go back to work in order to make monthly spousal payments, as well as payments of over $150,000 in stocks and bonds. At age 55, Robert Spangler is once again a single man. He wastes no time hunting for a new partner. Trading in on his charm and charisma, it will not take long. Robert Merlin Spangler was a very charming guy. Uh, he was very good with people. He was the kind of guy, immediately upon meeting him, you'd absolutely like him and he could befriend you very quickly. That was part of his personality, absolutely. Spangler places a personals ad in the Denver Weekly. One of those to respond is a retired bookkeeper from nearby Evergreen, Colorado, named Donna Sundling. Donna was a really nice person. She'd do anything for anybody. She was a lot of fun to be around and uh, never a harsh word. She was just a great person. Donna and the newly divorced Robert Spangler begin a whirlwind courtship. By August of 1990, they are married 
and Spangler convinces Donna to move with him to the small tourist town of Durango. But in a now familiar pattern, a shadow soon falls on the marriage. A potentially dangerous shadow. Robert Spangler's first wife and two children were found shot to death in a highly suspicious double murder-suicide. His second marriage is dissolved, resulting in an expensive divorce. Not to be deterred, Spangler marries again, this time to Donna Sundling, and settles into a new life in picturesque Durango. Durango is a classic Colorado mountain town. People are there because they love the outdoors, they kayak on their lunch hours, they hike all the time, and uh, it's just a community that has very little crime, quite prosperous, and is isolated from the rest of the world, but surrounded by beautiful mountains. For the third time in his life, Robert Spangler is a husband. The couple becomes deeply involved in the Durango community and Spangler himself referees soccer games for the local parks and rec league. Donna continues teaching aerobics at the Durango Sports Club, while Robert takes a job as a disc jockey at the local radio station. Spangler's on-air persona quickly establishes him as a local celebrity. Robert Spangler was a part-time uh, country music radio DJ. He was popular, he had a chipper, radio persona. Uh, he was well-liked and recognized wherever he went. He was always friendly and open. Um, people liked him. But Robert Spangler keeps his personal life a carefully guarded secret. When asked about his previous family, Spangler offers different versions of how they died. Over time, Robert told a number of different stories about what had happened to his family. In one, he said that his son was on drugs and he'd gone berserk and killed the whole family. In another, he said that there had been a car accident, that he was behind the wheel, the rest of the family died and he was injured but survived. And then he did tell some people that um, his wife had gone berserk and killed the kids and then killed herself. To all appearances, Robert and Donna enjoy married life, being active and spending their free time outdoors. Spangler turns his love of hiking into a part-time job, giving guided hikes of the Grand Canyon for tourists. But Donna does not share her husband's enthusiasm for the canyon. Donna always had a fear of heights, buildings, driving in a car next to a steep cliff or something. Uh, it always disturbed her. And when they were hiking in the canyon, they always went down on the more gentle trails because there wasn't the big drop off in the fear. Soon, Donna stops going on hikes altogether. Spangler becomes distant and the couple grows apart. By spring of 1993, Donna knows her relationship with Robert Spangler is in trouble. In a last-ditch effort to save the marriage, Donna agrees to one more hike in the canyon, despite her fear of heights. This time, the couple is alone. Donna would not have chosen to hike the Grand Canyon on her own, but Robert had talked her into one last trip because they were trying to patch their marriage up at the time. But Donna tries to remain positive and the couple leaves for a weekend excursion to the Grand Canyon. This last trip that she went on, she just had a weird feeling about going on the trip. She was really reluctant to go, but she went anyway. Although Donna Spangler suffers from vertigo, she's willing to face her fear to save her marriage. But trouble in a marriage to Robert Spangler can have deadly consequences. 
Easter Sunday, the couple sets out for the Horseshoe Mesa section of the Grand Canyon on the fourth and final day of their camping trip. It will be the last thing Donna Sundling Spangler will ever do. Just before noon, Robert Spangler shows up at the back country office. He claims there has been a terrible accident involving his wife. Robert told the rangers that he was setting up his tripod to take a picture and that his back was turned to Donna and when he turned around, she was gone, that she'd gone off the edge. Rangers thought it was unusual that when he reported his wife's fall that he stood in line patiently behind backpackers trying to get permits um, before he actually reported it. Park authorities raced to the location of Donna's lifeless body at the bottom of the canyon. The body was very beaten up uh, and, and took several stumbles on the way down. And, uh, and, and there wasn't much forensic evidence uh, for law enforcement to detect. Spangler tells authorities that after Donna fell, he scrambled down the side of the canyon, washed the blood from his wife's face, and covered her with a tarp before rushing for help. In comparison to uh, other homicide crime scenes where you typically have witnesses that have seen or heard something, or you have forensic evidence at the scene that you can collect, uh, law enforcement uh, was very challenged at this particular crime scene because th there wasn't any of that. If, if somebody didn't see the fall, um, there's really nothing else to go on at that point other than his statements. After questioning Spangler about his every movement that day, Park authorities release the grieving husband. After the investigation was wrapped up, the sheriff's department closed the case as an accidental death. Donna Spangler is dead at age 58, leaving behind five children and five grandchildren. Word of Donna's mysterious death spreads quickly through the media. People found the circumstances of Donna's death unusual because she wouldn't have wanted to be hiking there in the first place. And then the fact that it was um, during a picture, it's, it's kind of an old bad joke, you know, someone standing on a, a cliff edge and uh, someone else taking their picture and all of a sudden they fall off the edge. Even though Bob Spangler had always been a perfectly likable, reasonable guy and we had no other reason to suspect him, the story just didn't ring true with us and my editor and I and a lot of people just felt like he pushed her. The local community reacts to the tragedy with shock and disbelief. Even though Bob Spangler was in charge with anything, gossip and suspicion lingered and uh, in, in a small community like that, we, were, we knew when he was dating someone, a mutual friend uh, was supposed to go to the Grand Canyon with him for a hike, and all her friends advised her, don't go to the Grand Canyon with this guy. Robert Spangler has Donna's remains cremated before her family can make it to Colorado. At the memorial service, he delivers a eulogy which a friend later describes as tearless and weird. People started thinking that Robert Spangler's past was odd because he had two dead wives and he had a dead family and the circumstances were not normal. One was a suicide murder and one was slipping off a trail at the Grand Canyon. Robert Spangler is single for the third time in his life. For some, the pattern of sudden bachelorhood is just bad luck. For others, it is a clear sign of something dark and deadly and the secret life Spangler keeps well hidden. He has a way of dealing with problems permanently. Robert Spangler receives a visit from his second wife, Sharon Cooper. A year after the Grand Canyon incident, Sharon Spangler, his second wife, was going through a tough time and she actually moved back in with him in his Durango home. Uh, she rented a room from him. In a bizarre twist to an already remarkable story, 
Sharon Cooper's decision to reunite with ex-husband Robert Spangler will have tragic consequences and set off a chain of events that will lead authorities to solve the case of the mysterious widower and the gruesome parade of dead wives. Local radio personality Robert Spangler has already lost his first and third wife under mysterious and violent circumstances. First wife Nancy Spangler allegedly shot their two children before turning the gun on herself. And Spangler claims his third wife fell to her death in the Grand Canyon. But a shroud of mystery surrounds all these deaths and Robert Spangler himself. On July 14th, Spangler's second wife, Sharon Cooper, moves in with him after being estranged for six years. After Donna's death, Robert's second wife, Sharon, ended up moving back in with him in Durango. She was supposedly going through a hard time. She had just broken up with a boyfriend and was having some mental health issues, and so she moved in with Robert. Spangler and Sharon Cooper attempt a life together for a second time. It lasts less than four months. Spangler returns home to discover Sharon unconscious next to a suicide note. Spangler takes the unresponsive Sharon Cooper to the emergency room, but it is too late. Hours later, Sharon Cooper is dead. Uh, she actually came uh, to consciousness and spoke with the doctors and talked with them about having taken an overdose of Tylenol. The death is ruled an overdose and there is no criminal investigation. Whether by accident or by design, it is convenient for Spangler that he no longer has to pay spousal support. It is not the first time a tragic coincidence has worked in his favor. Robert Spangler denied having any responsibility in Sharon's death. Many of us have different theories about how her death occurred, though, and there's no doubt but that he had a lot of control over her at that point in her life. When news of Sharon's death reaches members of Donna Sundling's family, they contact the police immediately. They had been told that his first family had died in an accident, they knew that their mother had died in the Grand Canyon, and now another woman associated with Bob Spangler has died in close proximity to him. They began to wave flags, make calls to law enforcement, contacting agencies, and at that point, the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office reopened the 1978 deaths of Bob's first family. Arapahoe County investigator Paul Goodman gets to work re-examining the deaths in Littleton. It has been over 15 years since Robert Spangler's first family was killed. But Goodman and his team discover several pieces of evidence that shed a new light on what might have happened that December morning. The suicide note was strange because people usually don't explain why they are committing suicide, but yet this had a full explanation. It was typewritten, it was signed with the single letter N, which Bob explained was something normal for Nancy. She had a neurological disorder and often couldn't hold the pen long enough to write. Another strange thing was we found lots of checks that Nancy had filled out and filled out in their entirety in cursive writing and signed her full name to those checks. The other strange thing is that if she couldn't hold a pen long enough to sign a check, how did she hold a gun long enough to shoot her two children and then herself? The angle of the alleged suicide weapon, Robert Spangler's 38 caliber Smith & Wesson, plays the most critical role in determining just how Nancy Spangler died. This is a technique called test firing or proximity testing. 
and a, a weapon is fired at various distances from a target. You can see as the weapon is fired at very close ranges, and this is one inch, and we tested from two, three, six to nine inches away. You can see as that distance increases, you get less soot deposited. We can take this data back and compare it with the entrance wound, and we can determine that when the weapon was fired, it was at least six inches from Nancy's head. Goodman enlists the help of Arapaho County Coroner, Dr. Michael Doberson. Together, they recreate the murder scene based on the autopsy report and crime scene photographs. We did come up with a study that was completed at that same period of time, and it involved 116 suicidal gunshot wounds, and most of them were to the temple area and into the mouth, and then a few into the back of the skull, into the brainstem area. And this is a highly unlikely place for a suicidal gunshot wound. What we typically see in self-inflicted wounds is a contact wound, and that's where the muzzle of the gun is in direct contact with the skin. Uh, what's more unusual is to see self-inflicted wounds that are fired at more of a distance. If it is fired at a distance, it's usually a relatively short one, but to have a self-inflicted wound um, have a range of fire of six to eight inches is extremely unusual. Armed with proof that Nancy was murdered, Paul Goodman adds it to his growing file on Robert Spangler. In the meantime, Goodman has been working in conjunction with the FBI on the case of Donna Sundling, whose deadly accident took place on federal land in the Grand Canyon. The thing that makes this case really unique is that it's a multi-agency, multi-jurisdiction, multi-state investigation. There's a lot of forces to bear that are looking at Bob Spangler, and none of them individually just have enough to prove and, and establish probable cause to move a case forward. We didn't have a lot of forensic evidence. We didn't have witness statements. I think investigators quickly realized that unless we get a confession, it's going to be difficult to prove murder. But a full confession is unlikely from a man who for 22 years has declared his innocence in all of the deaths. FBI agent Leonard Johns seeks the help of expert profilers from the Bureau's Behavioral Analysis Unit. The first thing that the FBI profilers recommended that we do on this case was to build a, a, a thorough background on Robert Spangler, find exactly who he was, and find out everything we possibly could about his personality traits. As we built a more and more of a background on Bob Spangler, we quickly realized that he was very charismatic, he was very manipulative, he was very successful in everything that he did, and he usually got his way in just about everything in a personal and professional environment. Agent Johns works closely with county and state police to devise a strategy that will bring Robert Spangler to justice. Authorities keep close tabs on Robert Spangler, who is now living in Grand Junction, Colorado, a three-hour drive south of Durango. Grand Junction is the largest town on the western slope of Colorado. It's about uh, 50,000 people, mainly working class people. And it's kind of town where a lot of people know each other. And at the time Robert Spangler was here, there were a lot of community theaters. So he was involved in that and a lot of people knew him through that. Consistent with his profile, Robert Spangler is still craving the spotlight working as an actor in the local dinner theater. While in rehearsal for one of the plays, Spangler discovers he's having trouble remembering his lines. He goes to a doctor to pursue the problem. The diagnosis is cancer. Spangler writes to family and friends to tell them of his condition. During our investigation, one of our people had talked to a woman she later contacted him and told him that she had gotten an email from Bob 
explaining that he was suffering from a brain tumor, which was going to be fatal. Investigators are now in a race against time. The combined forces of Paul Goodman, Leonard Johns, and attorney Camille Bibles have to act fast if they are hoping to secure a confession and a conviction for Bob Spangler. The authorities descend on Grand Junction. To the surprise of no one, Spangler has married again to 53-year-old Judith Hilty. The police have to act fast before Robert Spangler's bad luck with wives claims another victim. Those close to Robert Spangler suffer a deadly fate. First wife Nancy was found dead of a gunshot wound, along with her two teenage children. Second wife Sharon is dead of a drug overdose. Third wife Donna falls to her death in the Grand Canyon while hiking with Spangler. The crack team of investigators join forces to get a confession from the suspected wife killer. We were able to verify that Bob did have an inoperable brain tumor. At that point, the investigative team decided it was time to step things up, and we went to Grand Junction to interview Bob Spangler. Investigators Leonard Johns and Paul Goodman make contact with Spangler at his home and request an interview. Spangler agrees. We led Bob into an interview room to talk to him. We interviewed him for several hours. We got some minor admissions from him, no confession at that time. We tried to convince him, ask him if there was anything he needed to get off his chest uh, to no avail. We ended the interview and we told him, Bob, we'd really like to talk to you again. His comment was, yeah, I know you would. The next morning, uh, we got a phone call and Bob Spangler wanted to talk to us again. This time, Johns and Goodman apply some of the techniques they learned from the FBI profilers at the Behavioral Unit. They start with Spangler's profile as an ego-driven, controlling narcissist who loves being the center of attention. One of the ways that we used that against him was to tell him that he was very important to us, that we could learn and, and study him, that the profilers wanted to do research on him, and that I was this young FBI agent that had worked some homicide cases before, but never dealt with somebody as prolific as him. And the fact that if, if he would just talk about the homicides, I could learn so much from him. Uh, he absolutely bought into that line of story. Another tactic the investigators employ is to stage the police office to exaggerate the size of the investigation. Other members of the team set up the sheriff's office to look like we had a task force on the case itself. On the board, it said Spangler Task Force, several people in there on telephones and on computers. Bob's head snapped to the right. He was very interested in what was going on in that room. He seemed impressed with the fact that he was the subject of so much attention. This was part of the strategy that the FBI profilers had outlined for us, and it was very, very effective. Investigators Goodman and Johns interview Robert Spangler for the second day in a row. In a room nearby, U.S. Capitol Prosecutor Camille Bibles watches the entire scene on a closed-circuit television. The profiler's strategy pays off. So I'm telling him that He's very important to us, that we can learn so much from him. The profilers want to study him and, and learn more about serial killers from him. But if we're going to do that, he has to demonstrate to us and tell us about how he's a serial killer. I'm accusing him of killing three of his wives and two of his children over a 22-year time span 
And after I've accused him of killing those five people, he looks at me and, and with this very piercing stare, and he says, well, you're giving me credit for one too many. There's four. Four hours into the interview, 22 years after the crime, Spangler's enormous ego gets the better of him. He confesses to the murder of his wife, Nancy Spangler, and their two children, David and Susan. In chilling detail and with a blank expression on his face, the psychopathic Spangler describes the carefully planned slaughter of his own family. Bob explained to us that that morning he had already made the decision to kill Nancy and he had earlier had her sign a letter in to a blank sheet of paper that he later typed the suicide note onto. He told her that he had a surprise for her and asked her to come into the basement to sit down at the table and close her eyes. He said that when she did close her eyes, he had earlier hidden the gun. He pulled the gun out from where it was hidden. Shot her in the head. Robert then heads upstairs, confident his children are still asleep, and continues with his plan. Shot his daughter, Susan, and then he went across the hall to shoot David. David had apparently heard the at least Susan's shot, and he was sitting up in bed. He shot David once, and David kind of went over, but he was still alive. And he decided that it wouldn't be in keeping with Nancy having shot David if there were two bullets in him. So he went ahead and smothered David into a pillow that was on the floor. When police asked Spangler why he killed his family, he told them he supposed he was selfish that it would be easier to kill Nancy than to divorce her and that his new girlfriend didn't like the children so this was just easiest all the way around. Hoping to secure a full confession, Goodman and Johns pressure Spangler about the 1993 death of Donna Sundling. Bob Spangler's adamant that he's not going to talk about the Grand Canyon homicide. Uh, Donna has adult children and he's very fearful that they're going to attack his assets if he confesses to her murder. We went back and forth, uh, used several techniques. Uh, we even told him that uh, he was interested in being known as a serial killer, but if he only killed the first family, he wasn't a serial killer. Eventually, he confessed to uh, Donna's murder also. Through the media, news of Spangler's cold-blooded confession spreads across the state from Littleton to Durango to Grand Junction. Robert Spangler's confession was really shocking in Grand Junction. It was all people talked about for a few months. And part of the shock was that the people who knew him thought that he was a nice man. They couldn't believe that he could do such a thing. Robert Spangler is arrested and taken into custody. With a full confession already secured, there is no need for a criminal trial. Robert Spangler pled guilty to first-degree premeditated murder of Donna. As part of our plea, he also admitted the killing of Nancy and his two children in Colorado. We wanted to add that to our plea to give closure and finality to Nancy's family. At the plea hearing, for many journalists covering the case, it is the first opportunity to see the charming and psychopathic killer in the flesh. The courtroom was crammed with people. Um, some of the victim's family members were there, and his fourth wife was there. She was surrounded by friends who were kind of acting as bodyguards. And when Spangler came in, it seemed like he was on stage. He was smiling, he was winking at his fourth wife. You know, he, he seemed just so cold and unruffled and he never did look at the victims' families at all. The sentence of life behind bars with no chance of parole is not the only life sentence for Robert Spangler. Nine months after his conviction, Robert Spangler dies in prison.
But for the families and friends of the victims, the Spangler murders will leave a lasting, haunting impression. This crime is more heinous and cold-blooded than just about any crime I've ever covered. He killed his entire family and then he left their family thinking for 22 years that their sister, daughter, whatever, had, had done this horrible thing and murdered her own children. And those people just lived with hell all that time. And that didn't seem to bother him. And then pushing the third wife off the cliff, you know, taking her up there and telling her that it was going to be a reconciliation. And it's, it's just so cold-blooded.